Oh, no, it's always on. Yep. yep. Well, the time has arrived, so uh, welcome, everybody, and I think uh, we will get our meeting started, uh, and we'll start with the roll call. Uh, Duel here. Warren's not here. Joe Johnson. Here. Ox is not here. Uh, Hartman. Miles is not here. Uh, Yes, Fox is here. Fox is <laughs> and McKay. Here. Good. Here. So we have a uh, quorum. You're right, Mary. Well, her sign is down there. I've got my sign spot. That's your sign spot. <laughs> Your assigned spot is where you sit. <laughs> okay, uh, we need approval of the uh, previous meeting Second. summary. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, uh, the first item on the agenda today is a uh, update from USD 259, and I'm going to let Mary make the introduction. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Mr. Fabian Armanderas, who is the operations director of US 259, a big job, by the way. Uh, they cover transportation, nutrition services, all the procurement for that. Um, all of purchasing and dealing with supply chain issues that we have a problem with today, and um, all, all of the supplies. And, and he also works, of course, with the, the school boundaries and the, the projections going forward for the, the school district. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how that impacts planning and the kind of things that we deal with. Uh, we also deal with transportation indirectly, of course, but it all impacts um, the, uh, the work that the planning department does. So please welcome Mr. Armanderas. <laughs> well, first and foremost, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity to be here in front of you today. Um, it, as, as I've shared with a couple of you earlier today, um, the Wichita Public Schools does not have a planning department. Um, unlike other urban school districts that, that do have an internal planning department, um, we have not um, in our history. Um, and so I, I think this partnership or being able to work collaboratively with you all, I think is, is, is a great opportunity. So I wanna thank Mary for, for having the foresight to reach out to us and, and, and for, for us to be able to share with you. Um, 
I've, I've kind of crafted this presentation based on something that I did with the Board of Education earlier in the month. Um, and so you'll get a little bit of an enrollment update and some of the enrollment trends that we're seeing within our school district. And you'll learn a little bit about how the school district makes strategic decisions into the future. Um, just to give you a little background on myself, um, I'm a, a USD 259 lifer. I have been with the district 22 years. I'd like to joke around that I was two, but no. Um, I started when I was 19. I was actually going to Wichita State and um, worked in the schools for, for several years. And then uh, when I transitioned to an administrative position downtown, I, I, I transitioned to the pupil accounting department following John Updegrove, who was kind of the, the, that was a kind of somewhat planning department at the time. Um, and so when I left that department, uh, we eliminated that that department, and this is a part of my job that I haven't been able to kick off. So it's followed me in every single position that I've been. So I went to transportation after that, and now I'm in charge of operations. Um, so uh, as we start, um, I this there we go. Um, I, I wanted, first of all, to kind of give you a little bit of the objectives for today. I wanted to introduce you a little bit to the Enrollment and Program Assignments Committee. That is the committee that makes decisions for the school district. It is composed of the school of, of the district leadership team. Um, uh, and, and so again, I, I'll talk to you a little bit about the composition and what that committee does as we review processes annually. Um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about the annual processes that we do to review enrollment. Um, and then share some highlights from enrollment trends. And I think this is gonna be important for you all to know um, as far as kind of what, what, our, our, where, what our, our trending is looking like for our enrollment, because we are uh, in a declining enrollment era, uh, which is not unique to large urban school districts across the country. Uh, it's just hitting Wichita a little bit later. And then I wanted to share with you a little bit about Southeast and some of the shorter pl uh, planning that we have, and then some of the longer term planning that we have. So EPAC, um, that is composed again of our district leadership team. We begin meeting monthly every October um, and our initial meetings focus simply on enrollment numbers. I'll talk a little bit about what our official enrollment is, which is September 20th uh, enrollment numbers, uh, but then subsequent meetings after that deal with program placements. Um, a lot of people assume that Wichita assigns kids on a neighborhood pattern only, and we do. We have boundaries for a reason. But as you will see later on, because we have magnet schools, uh, we can't serve a lot of our special education students or ELL students um, in, in, our, in our, their own district or their own, their own school, we assign kids to different schools. And so that further convolutes things a little bit. And so even those program placements where we place a special education program or where we place uh, an ELL, which is English language learners, those are our, our ESOL students, our students that are learning English, where we place those programs also make a difference, as well as um, as we look at some of our other like early childhood and, and though all those impact our capacities within our building. Um, any programming change is funneled through EPAC. And part of the reason why we do that is because whenever you add any sort of program to any building, there's also infrastructure changes. There's also staffing changes that need to be considered. And so this is our way for us to strategically understand and prepare for whatever resources we're gonna need to devote uh, to a particular building. Then end of year meetings, and this actually was a lesson learned from last year, um, are now focusing on future enrollment. So then we look at what, what students, what we project enrollment is gonna be at the following school year. Um, and so again, because of Southeast, um, we, are, we are looking further ahead than we were previously. And again, it allows us as a district leadership team to kind of uh, not only assess impact of programming changes, but also determine um, it was mentioned earlier, we are the largest share of county funding. And so we wanna make sure that we are um, being uh, strategic about the way that we are using those funds and that we're being efficient. And part of that is again, being able to prepare. Now, what is official enrollment? Um, official enrollment is really the main data point that we operate on. Uh, any school system, as you know, especially one as large as Wichita, our enrollment changes daily. We have kids that move in, kids that move out, kids that change, kids that change schools. Uh, and because of that, it's not a stagnant number. Our enrollment changes from one hour to the next. I often pull a report in the morning, and by the afternoon, you're looking at having 50 more kids in the system. So there's a lot of mobility that happens. Uh, and because of that, we use our September 20th official enrollment data as a, a way for us to kind of a point in time that we utilize for planning for longer term. And we've done this for many years. 
Um, it's also the count that determines funding. So we send a report to the state and the state determines what funding we get after that point. Um, it is pulled from our student information system, which is Synergy. Uh, and again, it provides data for enrollment trends, as well as we use that data to guide decision making. So as we look at this year's enrollment trends, this is a little bit as to kind of what our district enrollment is. Our total enrollment for the school year um, is 45,507. Um, and it is it is lower, I mean, I'm sorry, 47,507 is what our total enrollment is. Of those, about 2,500 students are enrolled in special schools. About 13,000 students are enrolled in our high schools. 10,000 students are enrolled in our middle schools and about 20, just under 22,000 are enrolled in our elementary schools. There is, um, there's the trending of, of kind of what the grade level distributions are. Um, and as you look at that line, as, as you look at that, um, there is a, a declining enrollment piece tied to this. So our highest grade levels is our ninth and 10th grade. Um, and that is the same across the entire city. That is our pain point right now. And that's why Southeast in some ways was such a challenge is we understand that, that there we, we have a capacity issue there, but that capacity issue based on the grade levels that we're seeing, um, it's eventually gonna flow its way out of the system. So we wanna make sure that we're being strategic in whatever long-term decisions we're making so that we don't take out so many students that they're gonna end up under capacity. I don't believe that will be the issue with Southeast because obviously of all the growth that we're seeing um, and some that you all have reported to us recently. But again, that is, that is part of the challenge that we're seeing is that ninth and 10th grade class tends to be our pain point. Um, and, and we're gonna see those kids uh, flow out of the system. That is what our um, demographic um, of, of ethnicity looks like for our system. We are a majority minority district. Um, and we've been this way for, for quite a few years now, for over a decade. Um, the largest population of students that we serve is Hispanic, about 37%. Our Caucasian or white population is next with 30%, 19% African-American, 8% two or more races, and then 5% Asian. 1% uh, is, is our Native American population. And it's been shifting. Uh, that Hispanic population has grown exponentially over the last 10 years, which I'm sure you all of planners have seen that throughout our city. This is what our 10-year enrollment looks like from 2012 to 2022. Um, and as you see, our, our highest enrollment year that, that we recorded um, was in 2014. And we were, I think, over 50,000, 51,330 students at that point. Um, after that point, we started to see a decline. And we started to see that decline begin at our elementary level. So we were already anticipating declines. What we were not anticipating was that 2020 decline. Um, that significant decline that we had, um, in, in, in that is COVID related. And what we didn't know when COVID happened, and part of the reason why we did not take immediate action was because we did not, we did not know what, what was gonna happen after. Were those, that decline was, were, were kids gonna come back to our system? Where did those kids go? What's gonna happen with all of that? And that really kind of put a big damper in our planning. We'd actually commissioned a demography study that gave us projections in 2019. And so we anticipated a slight decline. COVID and that COVID decline rendered all that data obsolete. Um, and so at that point, we decided to wait a little bit to make any long-term decisions. And that's part of the, that was part of the Southeast piece was because we did not, um, our enrollment hadn't stabilized enough. And so we weren't quite sure, even if we did projections, that they were going to be accurate, because when you build projections, you have to build them with prior year enrollment. Well, anything prior to 2019 um, is kind of rendered obsolete, and it's only going to skew the numbers. And so that challenged us significantly. Um, but again, we're, we're seeing declines everywhere, except in one portion of our city right now, uh, and, and that is that is Southeast. Um, but again, that, that, that 2020 number, but even since, since 2014, which is our highest number, we've dropped over 3,800 students. So our enrollment has declined significantly uh, since then. Here we go. About the only portion of our, our enrollment that's growing, and again, this is due to that large ninth and 10th grade class, is at high schools. So this is what our high school enrollment trend looks like. Actually, our high school enrollment numbers right now are the highest that they've been in probably the last 20 or 30 years. Um, they are high um, and, and the highest since I've been with the school system. Um, and so again, that, that, that is um, 
good for us currently. But again, as we look at those kids shifting through the system, we're, we're going to have some, some, some decisions to make. Um, but again, high school, that ninth and 10th grade class tend to be kind of our, our pain point. Some highlights from our high schools. Enrollment has increased by about 6% since 2012. Uh, it's the only level experiencing growth. Um, every single high school but one, and the only high school that declined enrollment was actually Heights High School on the northeast part of our city. Uh, but every single high school uh, in our system has had growth over the last 10 years. Um, and again, this year is the, is the last uh, or is the highest year of enrollment, and it's more than 10 years. It, it, it is probably 20 or 30 years. As we look at our middle school enrollment, which is our middle, uh, our middle tier, and we do see a decline in enrollment in our middle school years. Um, I don't know what it is about our middle schools, but we tend to see people stay with us at the elementary level, then that enrollment lowers a little bit, and then we pick back up at the high school level, uh, which is interesting. And we are doing some analysis in terms of what, what's happening at that level and tracking some kids longer term so that we can make the determination of are they leaving us and coming back or is it a different set of kids that are coming back for ninth grade in our high schools. Um, again, our peak for our middle school was in 2019. Uh, and then we saw that COVID decline. But since, since um, so as we look at that in, in some of the highlights, uh, we've decreased about two per, just under or about one and a half percent uh, since 2012. Uh, six of our 13 middle schools have experienced growth uh, since 2012, but since 2019, which is our highest, our peak year for, for middle schools, um, we've declined about, about 6%, 6 about 645 students. This is what scares me. Uh, and it is, it is the, the, the elementary numbers um, as, as we look. Um, Again, our, our peak number for elementary was in 20, 2015. Uh, and at that point, we started seeing some declines. This is what led for us to commission that demographic study in 2019, um, because we wanted to find out what we would anticipate in the longer years. But then COVID hit, and then that decline uh, increased even further. Um, so again, some highlights from elementary enrollment. Um, our, our elementary enrollment has decreased just almost just under 4,000 students since 2012, about 15% of our student population. Um, only four out of our 57 elementary schools have experienced any sort of enrollment increases uh, since 2012. And this is one that was heavily impacted by COVID. Um, since COVID, our elementary enrollment has dropped by almost 2,400 students, uh, which is about uh, just under 11% of our, of our total population. So, um, and it, it's been interesting. Again, we thought maybe those kids would come back. What I will share with you is, is these numbers that I'm sharing with you are not unique to large urban school districts. Um, and they're not unique to school districts in the country. Every single, you see news articles all the time. Every single school district experienced enrollment declines. Uh, and there are plenty of articles out there that are trying to figure out where those kids went. Uh, and it's a combination of pieces. Uh, but again, we don't, we don't have an exact idea of where all these 4,000 kids went. But again, um, we, we, we saw those significant declines. The piece that complicates any sort of projecting for the Wichita Public Schools is our, um, what do we call the neighborhood versus non-neighborhood enrollment. Typically what we do is when it, within a particular boundary, obviously we, we, we assign kids initially to what their neighborhood school is. So if you live in the Riverside Elementary boundary, when you come in as a kindergartner, we're gonna assign you to Riverside. But our families have choices. Our families have magnet choices. Uh, often if there are newcomers, and we've seen an influx of, of refugee um, uh, students in our community. And so as we look at all of that, that impacts also, and we have to often assign those students elsewhere because we can't serve them in their neighborhood schools. And so what we found out is 70% 70 of our students, 70.1% of our students are actually attending their neighborhood school. But the other almost 30% are actually either choosing to go elsewhere or we are assigning them elsewhere because we can't uh, serve them in, in, in the school that they, that they need because of specialized needs or, or some of those program pieces. So again, this, uh -huh. And Fabian, has that changed over time, that percentage, 70%, 30%? It's, it's been pretty stagnant um, as, as we've seen it. Again, we, we pride ourselves on choice um, and we have a variety of specialized magnet programs from technology to career explorations to environmental. 
Um, and, and we want to be able to offer parents those choices, but again, it further complicates our planning because it's not just a matter of looking at kids within the neighborhood. Uh, it's a matter of also trying to figure out, and it's not the same. At the lower end, there's an elementary school that's only keeping 45% of their kids. At the higher end, there's an there's a elementary that's keeping 88% of their, of their kids. And the interesting part about those numbers, even within the elementary, is that you would assume that the, the families um, or the, the schools that are keeping the, the higher number of their kids are uh, schools that are located in the more affluent parts of our city. But the reality is, no, it's the opposite. It's actually Plainview is the school that's keeping the largest percentage of their kids, um, those schools there. And again, it, it's, it's, in, it's, a, it's, it's a lack of understanding in some ways. And I think we need to do a better job of, of educating our community um, because they have choices. Those families have the same choices that every other single family in our school district has, but they may not understand the process of applying for a magnet school or some of those pieces that allow for those choices to happen. But as you look at the, at the elementary, um, about 67% of our elementary students are staying in their neighborhood school, 66% in our middle schools, and about 77% of our high school students are staying in their neighborhood school. And, um, and I think the high school number is higher because there's less choices for high school students. We only have one high school magnet, um, and we do have the IB program and the early college academy, but the choices are not as robust as we have at the, at, the, at the elementary and middle school level. So, and again, our non-neighborhood enrollment is about 29%. Um, and as you look at the story behind that elementary number, um, it is a combination of many things. It is our magnet school programming. And currently we have about 12% of our kids, our total enrollment population that are enrolled in magnet schools. Um, our ELL, our English language learners and newcomers represent about 15% of our student population. And again, those newcomers specifically, those kids that are brand new to our system from a different country, um, we have specific newcomer programs that we assign them to for a year. And those are only in a handful of schools. And we bust them there because we need to teach them really how the educational system works in the United States. And so they are assigned there for a year and then they're mainstream to a regular English language English learner program, English language learner program, I'm sorry, uh, within other schools. Um, and then our special education population represents about 17% of our students. But again, not all 17% are assigned elsewhere. We have a lot of interrelated students that can be served in their own neighborhood school, but we have some categorical programs and some even some special schools when you think about Levy and Bryant and Sowers that serve uh, majority special education students. So these are the types of assignments that we do within our system. And this is what really convolutes things. Again, your neighborhood schools, your neighborhood assignments, you just go to your neighborhood school. You have magnets, you have IB, pre-IB, early college academy. And these are things that we wanna do. We wanna give our community choice. They just complicate any sort of projections that we do. Uh, special education, again, ELL, English language learners and newcomers, special transfers. We do allow students, if they're assigned to a neighborhood school and they wanna go to a neighborhood school, there is a process called a special transfer process where kids can apply to attend to that school. And if both of those principals agree, meaning if there is enrollment, um, then they're allowed to go. It, it happens without transportation. So those parents have to get their kids there. But we have about a thousand students that are choosing this special transfer avenue too. Um, special programs, again, we have a lot of special schools that serve special needs students. Uh, we also have robust some robust choices for some of our students at our high school level um, with Chester Lewis. Um, so those, those students that maybe struggle the traditional high school route, uh, we offer some recovery special programming pieces there. And then students in transition. And this is something that a lot of our community doesn't know. And we've seen some huge growth in this area. Um, these are our homeless, our McKinney Vento, and our foster care students. And by law, we are required to transport those kids to their school of origin. So let's say I attend Riverside Elementary and something happens and I end up meeting the, the homeless criteria and my family is living with another family somewhere on the west side of the city or even in Goddard uh, or Hayesville, we are required to transport those students back to their school of origin and it's an unfunded mandate. So we are doing this. So we try to partner as much as possible with our surrounding school districts and work with them to be able to trans kid, transport those kids into the city. Sometimes that means they drive them to the boundary and we pick them up there. Sometimes that means they get them to us and we get into them uh, or vice versa. And so again, we try to, to, to partner as much as possible. 
We recently also contracted with a company called Dever Driven, uh, which what they do is they contract with some of the medical transport companies or some of your smaller transport um, organizations. They, they background check those, those students and they're able to pick up one, two, three kids at a time at a much lower cost than it would for us to send an entire bus to pick up one student. Um, so again, we're trying some creative pieces and especially with the bus driver shortage, I will say it's made us even more efficient, uh, too efficient because uh, now we're timed out because of that. But again, that's creating some challenges for us. Um, so just so you know, the Board of Education just uh, approved as of uh, November the, uh, for us to move forward with a, demo, a demography study. Um, and that demography study, RFP is out right now, is going to be similar to what we commissioned in 2019. Again, we don't have an internal uh, planning team. And as much as I can do projections based on current enrollment and what we're seeing, I, I'm, not, I'm not a planner and I'm not a demographer. I can't bring in plotted lots along with census data, along with birth rates, that big complicated formula that gives us some accurate projections. And so we are in the process right now of selecting a firm that's going to do a comprehensive um, boundary study. That's not only gonna focus on projections, but also is gonna focus on a demographic analysis of each of our boundaries. Um, what are we seeing trending? What are some of the labor statistics within that? So make sure that our, prog our programming matches that. Um, we're also gonna have them come in and do some capacity analysis for us based on programming that we have in our buildings. Um, they're going to do a boundary analysis, and there is an option for a boundary change process as a part of that. Um, I will tell you, if you were to ask me anecdotally, I would tell you, yes, right, it's going to lead to a boundary study. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't have those projections in front of me. Once they come our way, um, it'll be the catalyst of what will be, um, what will be a, a full comprehensive a boundary process at that point. Uh, we've seen some, our enrollment shifts have created imbalances. Obviously, when you see a, a $4,000 or 4,000 student drop, it's leaving some of our schools that are under capacity. And we've been moving staffing around and doing some of those pieces. But again, it, it's impacting us. So that this, this demography study will allow us to align the work uh, to be able to right size our schools. We've also commissioned a facility study with which SHEF is doing. And so they're going to give us the condition of our buildings at that point, um, and we're going to be able to merge what we're getting from the from the enrollment analysis uh, with that facility study and make some long term decisions for our school district. And that's really kind of where we're heading towards. Um, so again, that's that's going to happen throughout the spring with the hope of some of the reporting happening in the early fall. And if the need for a boundary process happens, it would happen uh, sometime after that. Um, and, and we would move from there. Again, there's a lot of things still up in the air. I don't know if you've all heard also, we, we are uh, in the process of finding a new superintendent. Uh, so there's a lot of things uh, that are coming down the pike, all kind of hitting at the same time. And so we are trying to be as strategic as possible to make sure that um, our community feels the least amount of impact. But I will, I will share boundaries and having been through a couple of them myself, everybody loves the concept of a boundary change until it impacts them. Uh, and uh, and that is and, and they are there are there are three B's that we talk about often that are kind of the biggest challenges for us: budget, boundaries, and the other B, which is bond. Uh, and so again, um, from a boundary standpoint, it it is a it is a lengthy process of community engagement and all of that because we want to make sure that we're making the right decisions for our community. Uh, and we are again we are we are a little bit behind of some of our larger school districts. The so larger school districts saw enrollment declines in, in the early 2010s. And so for us, we it, it's a good thing for us because we can learn from them and are able to kind of apply some of the processes that, that they've, they've done over the last few years. So now on to Southeast, uh, as we discuss Southeast, because I know that's a high area of interest for you all. Um, really, honestly, I, I wanted to say we've been discussing Southeast for a few years now in anticipation, and I will show you some data uh, that will tell you why we kind of held off a little bit over the last couple of years. The area of growing with potential for future growth, um, I, I think to the tune of 284 new um, residential uh, homes or, or duplexes in the area. So, so we are aware, uh, and I, I thank your team for sharing that information with us. Um, the trends that we we'd previously built were them keeping 73% of their kids. 
Um, we have new administration at the school, and we're also seeing that our more kids are wanting to stay at Southeast. So that number is increasing significantly, significantly, and so that's also skewing our numbers because they're keeping a lot more of their of their students in their building. Um, the functional building capacity for Southeast in, is 1982, and this is based on the study that we did in 2019. And there is a difference between capacity as as SJCF has determined in the past because again capacity sometimes you can measure kids in seats or square footage versus the number of kids that you have a functional capacity is is based on your actual usage of the building a special education classroom even though it's the same size as a regular education classroom can only hold probably eight students versus your regular education classroom can do you know 20 or 30. and so again there's differences even with the programming that we have in the building that impacts those capacity numbers. And so we're moving with a functional capacity and we're gonna get those numbers updated, but it is 1982. And again, um, the recommendations that we made to the board were based on um, detail analysis. This is the grade level distribution of, of, of Southeast um, of their boundary, total kids in their boundary. So it's all over the place, but again, it's not, as you look at ninth, ninth grade, uh, that is their highest point with, uh, first grade being right after that. Um, so again, it, their numbers are all over the place. And I think we're going to continue to see this with the growth in the area because as families move in, it's not like they're growing their way through their system. It's if I may move in with a third grader, uh, another family may move in with a different grade level. So you're going to see these numbers fluctuate significantly. Uh, so there isn't really a trending. And I don't think it will see that for a while. Um, this is what their official enrollment for the high school has been, where the prior slide was all kids within their boundary. This is high school only. And as you look, 2019, we were expecting growth and kind of preparing for that growth. And then 2020 occurred and we saw a drop. And so it made us kind of, okay, maybe we can hold off a little bit and see kind of what's gonna happen. Then we saw a growth in official enrollment 2021 and we were paying attention and then between last year and this year, it was, I think, 150 more kids. So we are seeing, and I think it's going to continue as this year progresses, if trends are, are that way. So again, it, it, that's what's prompted all of this. And, and I'll, we'll, we'll share a little bit of kind of what we're planning to address it in the shorter term, knowing that we have probably this boundary change coming in the longer term. This is what their enrollment looks like for the school. Their enrollment is 2192. If you remember, their functional building capacity is 1982. So there they're, they were a couple hundred kids over capacity. Uh, and we've been doing some things to lower their enrollment this school year, offering parents choices and all of that, which we're hoping will, will knock some, some of this number down, but then we have a longer term process. The interesting is in that reside and attend. Those are the kids that are actually living in the boundary that are attending that building. Where in the past, the numbers were around 68%, which is what you're seeing 12th grade. That was common throughout the entire building. They're now keeping 80% of their kids, which is a good problem to have. Kids are wanting to attend Southeast. It's just creating some of our capacity challenges. And again, further complicates our, our ability to project in some ways too. And again, that reside number is the total number of high school kids that live in that boundary versus the number of kids that, that are actually attending. So what, um, what we did in, in November to try to address this in the shorter term is the Board of Education approved a boundary change for Southeast. Um, it involves some of our elementary boundaries um, in portions of it. So parts of the College Hill, Adams, Jackson, and Price Harris elementary boundary are all slated to be reassigned now from Southeast. So this area in the red was previously assigned to Southeast. It's now going to be assigned to Heights High School. If we look deeper, deeper into those numbers, again, that Northern portion of the College Hill boundary has about 61 high school students in there, of which 46 are currently attending Southeast. Adams, 72, of 48 of which are at Southeast. Jackson, 80, which 62 are attending Jackson, or Southeast, I'm sorry. And then Price Harris is the largest chunk um, and there's about 169 kids that, that high school students that live there, of which 104 are attending Southeast. So in total, um, if all of the students were to, to move, um, Heights has the potential to grow by 260 students. 
Um, again, there are some elements that the Board of Education applied to it that are going to be gradual, and, and it's the right thing to do. Um, we're going to be grandfathering those current ninth, tenth, and eleventh graders. There, you you want you want those kids. If if I became a Buffalo my freshman year, I want to finish out as a as a Buffalo. And so we're giving them those choices. So again, that decline is going to be gradual, but then knowing what's coming down the pike in terms of growth uh, is only going to balance things out. So again, it's only going to further justify the need for a boundary study down the line. So again, that area now is going to be assigned a height, uh, and those kids starting next school year, any incoming ninth graders from that area are going to go to Heights instead of instead of Southeast. In just a little bit of our boundary process, we have a policy P1371, uh, which is establishing school attendance areas. Um, boundary changes, any boundary change must be submitted to the Board of Education by April of the prior school year uh, to be implemented the next school year. We try to do it as early as possible. Um, that's part of the reason why this change to Southeast was done in November. Um, most of the time we try to go in February, and that is part of the part of the reason we do that is we want to give our families choice. So if you don't like the new school that you're going to be assigned to, maybe you can apply to a magnet. And our magnet deadline is typically in March. And so we tried as much as possible. Um, as I wrap up, the, the only two things I, I, I want to share with you is, again, we, we look at enrollment trends often. We don't have a planning department. And so as much as possible, we try to bring in information uh, and then conduct demography studies, being a, bringing in a consultant um, every, every few years. Um, and that is what, the, the, what we're getting ready to embark on. Um, we, we look at these numbers regularly. Hasn't been a huge challenge because, again, the enrollment declines that we've seen. What I will share is we have the room for the students that we have enrolled in our system. The challenge is that where we have room is on the west side of our city and where we're seeing growth is in the east side of our city. And so short of busing, which busing isn't an option right now because of the driver shortage and cost and all of that, any, any relief is gonna involve a, a district level change in terms of boundary adjustments. And again, that's what the demography study will, will, will hopefully highlight for us because it's gonna be a matter of the domino effect of you take some from East or you take some from Southeast to give to East then you take some from East to give to South then you take some from South to give to West. And it's gonna be the same way on the other side. Again, even though Heights has experienced enrollment declines, we know what's happening in that area. There's a lot of potted lots in that area. So we anticipate growth in that area. So even though we gave them 200 students, um, we have concerns that that down the line is also going to have capacity issues. So we really want to make sure that we're getting ahead of this. And that's part of what this study is, is we're hoping will give us. Um, so with that said, I'm open to any questions that you may have. Again, it's, it's been a, a lot of work. Um, but it, it is, a, as much as I, I joke around about it, and, um, even though it's followed me, this is this, this this, I love doing this type of stuff. I love analyze, analyzing numbers. So it gets me away from the management pieces and allows me to focus on something that I can actually control. So <laughs> questions? I, I just want, I just like to say that uh, when uh, Fabian came to the district 22 years ago, we had a contract and we were doing a boundary study. And um, what a breath, breath of fresh air it was to work with, uh, with Fabian because he really gets into things and he has great knowledge. And uh, my question, however, to you is, is what's happened to the number of students that we've transported over the last 10 years? That number has actually stayed pretty stagnant. Um, we've had some interesting dynamics in terms of not only our magnet population has increased, but our ELL population has increased. So we've, we've, we've done some pieces there. Our special education population has, has increased too. And it's a true sign, and I'm really proud of this. Uh, when I came to transportation, we were running about 400, or 531 buses um, at $41,000 a year. Um, and through that, through efficiencies and some of the, the things that we did, we are, we're transporting the same number of kids now. But right now, and granted, the driver shortage also, uh, took us the opposite direction, but we're transporting the same number of kids with about 370 buses, 370. Now, it's not ideal. We should be around 400, uh, being, being fully transparent because we they're too tight, but yeah. But the number of kids that we're transporting has remained pretty stagnant, right around 16 to 17,000 students um, over the last few years. And a portion of that is not reimbursed. Is that right by the state? 
That is correct. We get reimbursement for kids that live over two and a half miles, but it's not enough to subsidize some of our, our costs. Um, our special education, I believe, is, is subsidized or is, is reimbursed at around 80%. So the district puts in 20%. Um, but again, we don't we don't get full reimbursement for so it's a huge investment. I mean, our transportation budget is I think 35 million. Um, it's it's our largest uh, because again. Costs have gone up where when I took over transportation in 2011, uh, we were paying $41,000 a bus. We're now paying $65,000 a bus a year. Um, so, and we've talked about a plethora of things, whether we wanted to internalize it and bring transportation internally, um, but it, there's a lot of challenges with that too. Um, so so uh, when you built Southeast, did you change the boundaries at that time? Um, because it's on the edge of, uh, of the area that it covers. And it would seem there's also gotta be a big increase in transportation of students there. Absolutely, and that's another part that increased the that has stayed allowed transportation to stay that way. Every single student that goes to Southeast qualifies for transportation. Um, and I'm having discussions with some of our city planners um, about infrastructure and maybe trying to figure out ways that we can partner um, so that we can strategically select those areas where a sidewalk would make a huge difference. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, we did change boundaries. And I, if you look at the enrollment trends that you see, they, they started and they've been gradually increasing over the last 10 years. Because I think our last boundary change was in 2012. Um, but yeah, we've, we've seen increases in that. Um, there were a whole plethora of factors that went into the decision of moving Southeast from its location to where it's at a lot budget and funding related. Um, and again, I, I, I don't have the full specifics, but yeah, it, it certainly has created some challenges for us, the location of the building um, from a transportation standpoint. Um, yeah. Uh, how have current gas prices changed your operations? Um, <laughs> obviously we're investing more. Uh, we try to project the best way possible. Um, we we're um, we're blessed that our, our our CFO understands the challenges, um, and and we've also um, benefited because you know it goes up and down, and so we benefited from some years where we were paying less than a dollar a gallon for fuel, um, but it certainly makes us um, think more about some of the pieces. We've actually done some creative things. We we've, we've um, partnered or not entered into an agreement with a company from McPherson and they're our single provider. Um, and so we're able to negotiate an agreement um, that allows us to kind of take advantage of, of um, lower lower costs in some ways. Um, it's not perfect, but it, it is, it, it's, a, it's a necessary evil. And so we just kind of try to react as much as possible and work with our CFO from a funding perspective. Um, but I think transportation is gonna be at the forefront of, of a lot of the discussions that we have in the near future, just because it is such a large investment. I mean, the 35 million, not only buses, but again, it is, it is largely fuel too. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, uh, Fabian, can you talk a little bit about the partnership with Wichita Transit and how that's worked out? Oh, yes, absolutely. No, and, and that's been crucial, especially at Southeast, actually. Um, we've been able to partner with Wichita Transit to be able to serve some of our schools through their, what they built, or now they haven't built there, through the regular routes that we were able to take advantage of some of that. So we have... I believe seven or eight buses that are serving. And in some of those instances, it's not just one bus, it's it's a relief bus coming right behind it. So if you go Pawnee, for example, heading up to Southeast High School, you might see two city buses picking up kids along Pawnee all the way up to Southeast High School and around. And that honestly, that's been the biggest blessing we've had when, when our driver shortage hit as significantly as it hit during the pandemic. Um, city transit was a lifesaver for us in terms of being able to provide us that. And that was um, a great partnership that we helped build with some of the people in this room um, that I'm really, really proud about. And, and Lisa Riveros, who's our amazing new transportation director, no, not new, but um, has been with us for a while, has done a great job of sustaining that. But a big thank you to them for, for their partnership and creative thinking to work with us too. So. Thank you, Mr. Armendariz, for a very detailed uh, presentation. We Glad to have you with us. And again, we welcome any opportunities to partner. We don't have an internal planning team. So as much as we can take advantage of the resources that you all have, by all means. So any information that you can send our way, which I've, I've seen some come up, by all means, because as much as we can anticipate, the better off we will be. Um, so we, we appreciate it. And again, 
I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And if you have any questions, you all have my card. Uh, feel free to send me an email or give me a phone call and, and we're here. We're, I'm very proud to work for the school district uh, and what, the services that we provide to our community. And uh, we want to continue that, that legacy that, that we have in this, in this community. So. Thank you, sir. Okay, next item is Mary Hunt is going to give us an update on uh, zoning uh, notification in other states. It's kind of been an issue for us. What? Sure. Hi. Okay, Ty Bent. There we go. Whoops, did I go too far? All right. Well, just this is just, this first part is going to be just a little um, uh, repeat of what we did a little while ago on uh, Wichita. But the big part, the most, the biggest part of this is you know what's happening in other, not just other cities, but other states. And so you know we talked about here in Wichita, we do the newspaper notice. We post a sign in a yard and uh, we do letters to property owners. So forgive me while I try to move this down. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, here's our policy. If it's if it's uh, you know up to an acre, we, we go out 200 feet for the mail notification. One to six acres, we go out a little further. Six acres to 15, it's 500 feet. So our whole thing is based on property owners get notified, not residents, just property owners. And it's all based on the, the acreage of the product, of the project. Okay, next slide. Okay, so then we, you know, we took a look at some other cities, um, Hutchinson, Mays, Derby, Andover, Salina, Overland Park, Lenexa, Topeka, all Kansas towns, and they all just honor the 200 foot minimum that is set by the state. The exception is Lawrence chose to go out 400 feet within their city. And again, property owners only. Next. So I started looking at beyond Kansas, went across the state line to Kansas City, Missouri, and they have 300 foot, but they also include their neighborhood and civic organizations. And this is where I think they start to catch people who aren't actual property owners. They just live in that area. The thing you have to have with that, no matter what city you're in, is that you have to know what the neighborhood and civic organizations are and their information has to be up, up to date. You know, you got a civic organization and if it's pretty solid and it's functioning, you know, you're gonna have a, a, a pretty successful reaching them. But sometimes neighborhood associations, and I think that's true here, they, um, they exist but some of them function well, some of them have no leadership on occasion, or it's an obsolete phone number or email address. Those are some of the um, kind of challenges you face with that. But if, if that was indeed intact, you could be reaching non-owner residents. So um, you get to uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Theirs is uh, similar to ours, 200 foot notification. And then they certify that they posted the sign, okay? Bentonville, 200 feet. Oklahoma City, this is an interesting one. Both, um, both Oklahoma City and Tulsa. 300 foot notification. However, if that 300 foot area and they start looking and they have fewer than 10 owners, property owners, they have to keep going out. And then they, you know, they, they, in, in, uh, um, they, they keep going out until they reach those 10 separate property owners. And then in Tulsa, they want 15 separate property owners. So they just have to keep going and going and going until they, they hit that mark. And that could be quite a distance. Next. 
Okay, Des Moines. Um, Des Moines was very interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, kept, I kept trying to think about how to, how to organize this information because Des Moines doesn't actually require you to notify anybody by mail. But in Des Moines, they have opted to do it. They have their own local policies on doing it. So, but they also have some, they also have these public meetings that the applicant has to organize. The applicant has to go out and reach out to the neighborhood around them. And again, this is a nice way to capture people who aren't literally a property owner. And they have to conduct the meeting. And they have to then send, uh, provide a summary of that meeting and justify that they have done their due diligence on capturing that audience. They can't just say, well, we rented a spot at a church and nobody showed up and we've done our duty and, and we're done. They would say, no, no, try harder and go get information. Then they want summaries on what happened at that meeting. What were the, what, especially what are the, what are the residents' concerns? Okay. And are you able to, are you able to kind of tweak your proposal to meet that? And what happens here a lot is that they get all of this, this, um, what could be conflict or acrimony. They iron that out before they ever get to the public hearing. Okay. And so, but they have different distances for notification. Uh, on conditional uses, 250 feet. Uh, but if, it, if there's a cell tower, they want, want it going out further. 250 feet for a variance. Um, a map amendment is 250 feet. And that, that, that's their version of a, of a zone change. But all these neighborhood meetings come into all of this. So um, what I did here just for myself is, um, I call it like tier one. You want to amend the language in your zoning code, or you want to amend the zoning for a piece of a piece of property or a map amendment. And those include the most amount of um, reaching out. They have to send letters. They have to have meetings. Everything requires a pre-application meeting, and um, and that is heard by the planning and zoning commission, as well as the city council. And so, uh, yeah, neighborhood associations, and they refer to sending these letters as a courtesy. It's a courtesy notice. The city picks up the tab on it. Then you have your next tier, which are your conditional uses. And that is heard by the board of adjustment. And they conduct the public hearing. And so, kind of tamps down a little bit. It's not, it's not quite as intense. Uh, again, they have their, their uh, neighborhood communication. Uh, they wanna get those um, issues resolved before the public hearing. And uh, so, and then you, you move on like to a, a variance is similar to that. And then they have what they call zoning exceptions. Zoning exceptions, they divide into two categories. Type one, is no public notice, minor modifications. It's kind of like our administrative adjustment, except they have another version called type two exceptions. And that actually inclu includes a public hearing and a board of adjustment approval. Uh, here in Wichita, a lot of these things would be, um, uh, it would just go through the administrative process. You want to adjust the, the setback on your side yard setback by a few feet. Here, you, you can do that administratively, but there, it still goes through a public process. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but it, it appears that they've gone to a considerable amount of work trying to reach people that they haven't normally reached if you just went after your um, property owners, okay? Just some of the ideas they had there. Okay, next. Okay, and then we'll go back to Denver. Denver uh, Denver includes electronic mail. If you have email addresses, they consider that a, 
a legal notification to a property owner. Otherwise it's 200 feet. And then Broomfield up north of Denver, a thousand feet. And that's for a PUD or a site development plan, um, special review, concept review, et cetera, final plats. And then uh, 200 feet for a variance and 500 feet if you wanna rezone property. So it kind of resembles what we have here in a way. They just, um, they just have different ways of going about it. So can I answer any questions on that? Anybody? So Mary, where do you plan to, to take this? Are we gonna consider making changes to our code to uh, reflect something different than what we're doing? Well, I think that I think that's kind of the question. Can I have the next slide? Okay, I had some conclusions here. Um, next slide. Okay, next steps. And my next steps are actually just questions, things that need to be pondered here. Is, first of all, is the information I've provided you sufficient? Do you want different information from cities, more cities, whatever? Um, do you think that the city of Wichita's notification processes are appropriate now that you've seen what maybe some other cities do? Um, should non-property owners be included? Should we make efforts to figure out how might we reach out to non-property owners who are in the area? Um, and that, that kind of brings the next one. Should we follow Colorado and Oklahoma on the minimum number of property owners notified? Um, and, and then you have developers hosting a meeting. You know, if somebody just wants to switch from a single family, you know, SF5 to a duplex, do we really make them go through the process of a, gathering all the neighbors together? Or at what point should we? And then any other recommendations? Yeah, Scott. I'd like to add just a little bit of uh, some more perspective to this, which is just that this issue has been something that comes up every once in a while at a planning commission meeting. You, you all have heard, you know, folks saying, well, I didn't get notified or the, that's, that's outrageous that the person, you know, next door didn't get it or whatever the, the, the issue is that comes up. The other thing that's happened, secondary thing that's happened is that uh, you know, council members have, I think that they've, you know, there was, They've heard that before, and they're curious about what the practices are. And so what this is an opportunity to do is to identify what are our current practices and really how do we stack up to other communities, both in Kansas and outside of Kansas. And, you know, Mary, thanks for the, for the report, because, you know, in looking at this, as I look at ours, you know, it's based on the size of the application area, and it ranges from two to a thousand feet. And when I look at what the other communities are doing, it looks like a lot of them are at 200 feet and that a few of them go out to, to a thousand feet, but it sounds like that's kind of different kind of circumstances, kind of a, uh, maybe a different magnitude of project. And I think that ours based on the acreage has been pretty sophisticated. And it, I know it's been in place for a, a while, but I think, you know, based on what we're seeing in the other communities, I don't, I don't think that it's out of line with what other communities, I think it's actually more generous than a lot of other communities. And I think that it gives a finite measure unlike some of these other communities where it could be a little bit difficult to determine which category you fall into. Sorry, I guess that was a little bit of perspective in terms of why this is coming to you, but then also some added perspective in terms of, I think the big takeaway is, are we out of line or out of sync with what other communities are doing? And I don't think we are. Uh, Joe. I would only suggest that we try to notify non-property owners. And I understand that's a problem, but if we make, make a good effort, that's all we can do. How, how would we do that? Yeah, that's the question. The address of the property is within the area. So the fact that the owner doesn't live there, you still have the addresses of the property. So it seems to me it would be very simple, but it would definitely add to the number of notices you're sending out, especially in urban core areas. If you're interested in looking at that, um, because we've, we've done this in kind of really small increments, like what's going on in Kansas, what's going on around Kansas. 
we can come back at a future advanced plans meeting, maybe next month, maybe the one after, and give you the prices that we're seeing for the cost of the mailings and also what that would do if we were to mail it to uh, the properties themselves, what that would do to the cost, the overall cost and the number of mailings that would go out. W would that be helpful? Well, it would. I wonder if there's some way to assess part or all of that to the applicant. That is um, typically covered as part of the application fee. So the process, and we can we can cover this more in depth at the presentation. We can talk through uh, what our current process is, which is that they would be required to get a list of properties from a title company. They within the notification area, they bring that to us, and then uh, we mail the letters using those addresses to the property owners, and so the the fees. Uh, to do that is covered as part of the application fees. What, what do we mean? No. Postage, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, sir. Well, excuse me. When they when they go to the title company and request that, that's required as part of their application, and they pay the title company directly. The last time I checked, and it's been a little while, but the last time I checked, it was one hundred and fifty dollars minimum that get, got you ten addresses. And there was fifteen dollars thereafter. They can get pretty expensive if you got a it big. It can, end. yeah. But then, just like Ann said, you've got a column that says, "Here's the address adjacent to the subject property." Then you have the mailing address of the owner, and so it would cost us more to mail twice. So, so it should not cost additional money no. as far as the title company is concerned, right. because we would already have the property address. The additional cost would be the additional postage and just printing the materials. Mm -hmm. Scott, what do we do? Um, Ann mentioned downtown the core area. Some of those properties have maybe a hundred, not maybe 20 landowners. That, that, in part, is the reason why they have to go to the title company. We need to get the list from the a certified and list. And we notify all those. If they're property owners, then yes, we send it to the property owner address. How do you know if a property is uh, being rented or not? Yeah, typically, we don't know for sure. But in general, if the, if the property address is different than the mailing address of the owner, we can assume that it's a rental. Now, you know, of course, PO boxes can be a little bit different, but if it's out of state, we certainly know. Could we not go uh, directly to the register of deeds instead of uh, going through a title company? That is a good question, and I don't, I don't have the answer for that one. We'll have to look at that. Probably wouldn't want to take on the extra work for that, but that's where the information comes from, right? I believe so. I, I think the it's, I think that we rely on the title companies being the intermediary to make sure that any kinks or things are worked out, and that they will provide one that's a certified list. They are certified, and insured, and bonded, and everything else. Or registered deed situation, you'll throw it right back on the applicant again, or anybody else around there. In my opinion, and so that's you know that's why you go to, you know, when I started in the business, we didn't even have title companies. Attorneys did it all. Yeah. So that that's one of the reasons why, I, you know, the only thing that I could see is that I think our system we got right now is pretty good, except for the fact you don't very seldom see the owners of these properties come in and complaining. It's the people that's written from them or something that's that way. And anything that might be is to say, just send it to the addresses rather than send it to the property owners. And, but you know, the, the cost to send it is the insignificant amount. It's the administration in getting to that point that's gonna cost the city, it's gonna cost everybody more money. Now, and I don't think you can take a John Doe wants to zone a piece of property and put him in the same category as a commercial developer that's doing it because he's going to go to these people to begin with. Like a guy subdividing a piece of ground, they're going to go to the neighborhood to begin with. I mean, in 99% of the time, I would say. The other people don't know how to do it and, and can't afford it. So the one you're going to really hurt is not the people doing it for the living. It's the individual person that wants to put a garage on or change a little zoning or something to that effect. 
And what I could offer is we can come back with some maps that would show you kind of the number, just examples of how many properties would be in the notification area. And then out of that, we can extrapolate how many mailings it would take and then what the cost would be for that and, and give you some numbers that you can work with. Scott, I don't disagree with you. The only thing is you got certain areas that you might, I don't think there's what can be one rule for everything. You take the center, center part of the city of Wichita, I bet 85% of that stuff's rental property. Yeah, I think I think the example we would do is just count the number of properties and then for, just for estimating sake, say what's the worst case scenario? Let's say double it. Let's say they're 100% renters. What would be the impact to the overall cost of the mailing? And, well, and your time. Yes, and time. Um, I can what's, talk with Mandy and figure out what it takes to do the, the mail out. What's interesting to me is the communities where they said, if we don't find 10 property owners, then we're going to make the space bigger. That doesn't make any sense because they're not proximal. Mm -hmm. To me, if you only found 10 property owners, you would then use that as the reason to notify renters or to send to the address because that means you haven't notified very many people in the area. Most of the time, does that make sense? Yeah, but and and the, the problem with that, in my opinion, is, is that uh, why would you do? The, why would you duplicate? Why would you go and find if there's ten landowners in the, in the property, and then if there's not, then they expand it. That's another going further. Or just why not just send it out to the go by address? You made the comments. Go by address and say, you know, the only problem you'll have there is that you know, every, th th every 30 know. days or every 15 days that the tenants may change. But if you're wanting to cover the people that's affected by the area, not the landowners, if you, but the people that live there, then you, the only way I know to do it is do it by address. If you, if you notified by address, could you eliminate the signage, which to me is cumbersome. It blows away. People don't see it. Everybody wants it bigger, which means more will blow away. To begin with. <laughs> On, on on purpose, we've actually focused just on the mailings on this portion. And if you'd like to do another segment uh, on the signage, we're more than happy to do that. But just for the sake of complexity, we've we've kept this discussion so far at the mailing. And very very happy to go on to signage. But if we can, just if my humble request would be if we could f figure out where we want to be with mailings, and then certainly we can go on to the signage. Yeah. But Mary, about do we know if any of these other states or cities? have signage like we do? Yeah, they do. They all require signage? Yes, of some sort. God, I want to make sure that we, I thought I heard somebody say, maybe we don't notify the actual owner if somebody else rents it. I don't think we can ever forget the owner. And, and, and I very much appreciate that comment and all the comments that have been made. And I'll tell you um, the feedback that I'm receiving anyway, so at least I've, what I'm hearing is that it would be beneficial to come back at a, at a future advanced plans meeting. It will bring you some maps that would identify a typical notification area, how many properties would be involved, and what the impacts would be if we uh, did the mailings not only to the property owners, but also to the properties themselves. So how much would that be in terms of the number of letters? What would the cost be? And not only the cost of mailing it, but also what would be the administrative process? What does that look like? Could you do that with the with some cases that we're actually looking at? Yeah, we can definitely do that. Yeah, I think that would be worthwhile. I think we ought to look, uh, look at... Uh, at the issue of uh, renters, I think there's probably a, a philosophical question involved, and that is, uh, do renters have the same rights to uh, protest uh, within this area that property owners do? Well, and that gets into another topic area, which is the protest. And the protest is set up by state statute, and we reflect that. And so it's only the property owners that can protest, and they have to have all the property owners sign off on a protest form. No. So if that's if if that dictates uh, protesting, uh, I don't. How much effort do we want to go into notifying renters? And I think to, in order to answer that question, we can come back with a a good yeah. graphic that will show you level of effort and cost involved. The only problem I have with this whole thing is why are we comparing ourselves to somebody else? 
We, we uh, the reason why we looked at other communities in Kansas and other communities outside the state is just simply to be able to answer the question, are we, are we way out of line with what we're seeing in other practices in, in and nearby communities? I don't believe so based on this information, but uh, I'll certainly open to other opinions and perspectives on it. I would believe if we as a commission would take each week, each meeting and go around to these properties that are gonna come up that's supposed to have notification, you'll be surprised how many of them, there is signs there. Somebody may come in here, don't want it and say, well, I didn't know what did, I wasn't notified. And you, you just drove by and saw a sign. Right. I agree. Okay, well, thank you for the presentation on this and we'll look forward to more information on it. Okay, so the next item is a uh, vacant lot inventory. Hey, Stephen. There we go. Okay, next slide. We've kind of gone through this before with you. Uh, we've basically been through this process of using some aerial maps with uh, generalized land use and uh, looking at uh, adjacent ownership on these things that the appraiser says are vacant lots. Uh, and Fox has helped us out with some of this verification uh, looking at adjacent ownership as well as doing a drive-by and then we've uh, brought that into GIS. Next slide. So far we've been able to uh, cover an area of about two and a half square miles in the northeast and uh, there was one little uh, initial pilot which was I think about a uh, between a quarter and half mile a little bit further west, but uh, all in all, the next slide kind of shows a little bit more detail of what this looks like with the uh, blue actually uh, being vacant and the red uh, not actually vacant. And uh, we've been trying to do this in the uh, established central area. Uh, next slide. Uh, this. I would say what we've done so far could be considered a pilot project, but uh, it would really ne need to get a larger share of the ECA verified. Uh, and if we had a better idea of where the vacant lots actually are, then we could track permits for demolitions as well as uh, new construction over time, uh, and then do a separate uh, element to the development trends report where we could uh, track these and uh, show them in a, a different map or, or uh, something of that sort. Uh, we don't wanna use these for the regular vacant lot report because these lots would not be tied to specials and uh, uh, subdivision activity where we're putting in infrastructure. Uh, to include these lots would create uh, quite a distortion. The only exception we've made in the uh, ECA or, or the uh, central statistical development area is in areas where we have actually uh, put in a new subdivision Typically, these are uh, larger land holdings where someone comes in, buys a piece, and then does a, a subdivision, uh, much like the project uh, North Riverside, uh, north of the golf course recently that you had where they're putting uh, patio homes in. There was another uh, project out on, uh, well, between, south of Second Street and towards um, Meridian, I believe, where they uh, sold off uh, an old piece of school property or something and put in a whole subdivision out there. And we tracked that for a while. So these, these are kind of rare in the ECA in terms of what we do in development trends. 
but if we did this, maybe this uh, would spur some uh, interest and in development. The thing is, it's going to, in order to really accomplish this, we need a larger uh, number of people involved uh, to do this. Uh, and maybe we do this in two phases where we uh, look at adjacent ownership first and try to whittle this down. I don't know if maybe we can't get with the county appraiser or uh, county GIS and figure out some way to do this. Uh, I know they have a code for lots that have a garage, which is a supplemental use uh, in, a, in a lot to a larger holding. Uh, it's a separate code. I don't know if there's a way to get a separate code for property that is supplemental to uh, uh, an actual residence. Uh, that would be uh, something maybe we should pursue over the long term. I've just been doing some brainstorming over this. Uh, and another thing is, I don't know, could we team with a class at WSU to do some sort of a, a further uh, project with this, uh, uh, doing some field survey work or something, uh, just kind of, kind of brainstorming, but uh, just uh, wanted to present this to you, kind of give us some of your, some of our thoughts in this and see uh, if you had any other thoughts or questions. I think the idea of, with the um, contacting WSU is a great idea because they're um, uh, people, well, and they're, and they're doing studies all the time for, for projects, for classes. Yeah. My comment, Stephen, is first public apology that my pilot study is all I could get done. It really <laughs> is time consuming. And it of course, is. I was picking the areas that have the densest vacant lots. Yeah. But I still believe if you could extrapolate the property taxes per lot from the county system, it's very clear when there's no nothing built on a lot because the property tax is $32, not mm -hmm. $1,200. And then is it paid? Because if it's not, then you see, then you can track back based on that data, and that would certainly whittle down what you had to physically go visit, if that made sense. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the county, there has to be a way they've got the data that we could get a report that allow you to, yeah, instead of driving by. No, well, and, and something else to explore too, what, what we see in GIS is only a small portion of all the data that is collected on a property. So maybe there are other ways, you know, to feed in an additional set of data or something on this. And, and you know, the land bank folks should be really interested in this oh, information, yeah. too. So I almost think making some challenges to them to help with the process or identify some steps hmm. would be really good. No, I think I, I agree with Joe. Pursue this with the real estate school at WSU because they got nothing but time and that could be you know, they can get grades and stuff from the thing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm serious. There's a, a means yeah. behind what you just got through saying. Yeah. Is it's going to take actually professional staff people. All you're looking is for statisticians, data, 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 data analysts, collections. All you data, data analysts or students are the ones who can figure out how to extrapolate this data sure. in a way we can get it honestly. I think students who are in data analysis would be the ones to go to who could figure out how to get the information from Subject County GIS in a way that would be usable and reportable for this purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you know, with Longhoffer, I know it's been probably 10 years ago, we did similar to this, what we're doing now because it, was, it wasn't on existing lots yeah. as much as it was uh, infill areas that were not complete subdivisions that were not complete in fill areas. Mm -hmm. What we were looking for. So, who determined the blue versus the red on this map that we're looking at? You did. Stephen and I created a criteria, basically. Yeah. 
if it's red, there's no nothing on that lot, but the land is being used by the adjacent owner. Mm. It's fenced together, you know, which is something you can see visually um, and and clearly in use by the adjacent owner and not saleable or buildable for that reason. And I think there was a trend for a while that the adjacent lots, when a house was torn down, what I understand is that the adjacent property owner was allowed to say, yeah, I want to start paying the property tax on that lot and using it as my own. So when houses were torn down, a lot of families said, oh, yeah, I want more green space around my house, you know, so because um, they didn't have to buy it at that time. So it's pretty common, you know, to see that connection. Interesting. Are there any other questions on this? Uh, I'll be interested to see uh, where we go with this and, and see what, you know, what the end accomplishment is. I'd like to uh, take this time too, Stephen, to thank you so much for your work uh, with this committee. Uh, the detail uh, and analysis that you provided us has been invaluable. Uh, and we wish you all the best in your retirement. Oh, thank you. And I'll I second want to remind that. everybody that we have a reception tomorrow from 11 to 2, is it? Yes. Yeah. Where will that be? Here. Right here. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for your work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure serving. It's, it's been challenging. It's been interesting. Uh, it's evolved over time and uh, uh, technology has helped us do a lot more today than we could when I started here. <laughs> okay, next item is uh, planning department to work plan. Yeah, so uh, this is really kind of more of a conversational item, so I won't, I won't go up to the podium, but, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to point out that we distributed a handout um, in print here for the group that are joining us in person, and also it was emailed out to the advanced plans members uh, who are joining electronically. And what we've come to is just that we're getting more demands on our time than we have time to be able to fulfill all of those. And so it's it's a it's a way of kind of at least identifying what projects and initiatives we likely have coming up. It's not comprehensive. But, um, it, it, and I wanted to bring it to you all so that you could look it over and just let me know if you've got any questions, suggestions, say, hey, we're missing something or something is a higher priority than, than what, it would, and actually we don't even have them prioritized on this yet. Uh, but let me know if there's something that should be a priority that we, we maybe are, are missing. So uh, with that, what I'd like to suggest is that I can come back uh, at the next meeting and maybe if you've got any comments or suggestions in the meantime, that'd be great to get and we can have a more robust discussion maybe at the next meeting. Sounds good. We can take a look at that and uh, look forward to more discussion on it. I think we can discuss that for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, Next item is project updates, uh, Scott. Yeah, so um, this is the planning department updates, a similar situation where we printed this out and have distributed it and also emailed it out just, just shortly before the meeting. Um, the things that I would point out on this are, as always, we're tracking the cases and for non-subdivision items that come before you all, we finished in 2022, we're projected to finish at 214, which is just below uh, our five-year high of 229 last year. So um, we've done a, a large number of cases. And when I talked to Philip about this this morning, he also pointed out that uh, there's been a number of PUDs that have been reviewed this year. And those custom cases, that custom zoning requires additional staff time and, and work and deliberation at the MAPC. So we're going to look into verifying, but we, we think that we've done more PUDs this year than we had done the previous year. So, um, but it's been very robust in terms of cases. And of course, the infamous uh, October 6th caseload was one that really drove quite a few of those. So... Um, subdivision cases, 
Oh, and by the way, with all of that, I have not, I don't think I've told you how much we appreciate you serving on the MAPC, especially with the October 6th cases that took us past five o'clock. So thank you, as always. Um, subdivision cases on the next page on page three. Uh, again, this one is the five-year high. We did 79 cases as opposed to 69 the prior year. And so Neil and uh, Kathy Wilson have been pretty busy on this. And uh, so one thing that we're looking forward to is moving into the, tracking the number of lots uh, that are created. And we'll work to do that beginning next year. Uh, page four is just the, the uh, matrix that has uh, the number of cases at the individual meetings. And one thing you'll notice is the yellow boxes of highlighted uh, times when the number of cases for a particular type of case has exceeded our capacity to process that on, uh, through current plans with current plan staff. And um, you can see that there was quite a few of that in the beginning of the year. Uh, we've had two things happen, which is number one, our staffing has increased in current plans were fully staffed. And at the same time, our caseload has, has dropped to about six, seven, eight cases for MAPC meeting. So uh, we're catching a breather kind of at the end of the year, which has been really nice, especially with the holidays. On page five is um, just the uh, totals and averages and all of that good stuff for uh, what's happened with the cases. And you can see that our non-subdivision items, our average is just under nine, it's 8.9. And now we estimate that our capacity in current plans is right around 10. So we're, we're right about that level where I think, think I, I wanna see us. Um, the challenge is gonna be how do we moderate kind of those, those peaks that come in and what do we do when we get another October 6th. Um, on page six talks about our staffing and I'm very happy to say that we are now fully staffed in the administration division. We recently hired in November, we hired Brian Thompson and he's joining us to be the division supervisor. So um, he'll be uh, managing or supervising our administration staff and the planning techs. Uh, current plans is uh, fully occupied in terms of no vacancies there. Advanced plans is the one where we've got uh, one vacant position right now. We'll have a second one as of Tuesday. So we're uh, working on hiring for those. And then in addition, uh, we have the two um, associate planner positions, which become available for us to hire in 2023. And then we also will have uh, two intern positions that we can fill for the summer of 2023. So uh, the, one of the challenges, which is kind of neat that we're having is where are we gonna put everybody if we were to fill all of those positions? So um, going on to page seven, short-term rentals. Uh, what I would highlight on there is uh, same conversation as last time, but uh, this time we're looking at the dabs and we've got a couple of dabs that we'll be doing presentations to next week is the same information that you received at a prior advanced plans meeting. So we're int very interested to see what kind of feedback we get from them. Uh, solar regulations, I need to schedule a request to schedule a county uh, briefing during a staff meeting. Nightclub in the city, we still need to get together with the nightclub owners and proprietors, um, haven't gotten that scheduled yet. And with the holiday season, could might be a little tricky. Home occupation, daycare, uh, again, this would be one that will be um, impact, impacting the county as well. So I'd like to do a briefing with the commissioners on that. And then places for people, largely the same. Um, the incentives, uh, you know, really with MABCD uh, presentation that came, uh, came up in October, land bank is moving right along and zoning. We continue to, um, the duplex discussion, I need to coordinate with some city staff on that one, but I think there's been an expressed desire to take that to the dabs. And so I wanna make sure that I've got that right and figure out the schedule on that one. So with that, that's the update, but I'll stand for any question. Any questions uh, on this item? Land Bank made the news this week uh, because they haven't acquired a property since they started. And because the holdup seems to be the, the question about whether Properties can go to the land bank and skip the tax sale. Um, so any, I think that's an interesting hiccup that I thought we solved way before. But anyway. Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry. And then I would absolutely, absolutely love. I would love to know how much when we approve a new subdivision, how much that subdivision property is expected to bring in as revenue in the future and how much the services to that new development will cost. And I don't, how would that question be answered or can we answer that question already? In it's, other words, fire and police. It, I, it's an interesting question. I don't believe that we've got any numbers on that. Um, if you're interested in it, what we can do is we can look at some options for research in the future and bring that back to Mr. Duell to see if that's something for an advanced plans agenda. But I'll tell you, we wouldn't have the capacity probably to do something like that um, wholesale right away. It would probably be something that we'd look at even how do you even get your arms around that? Yeah, you'd have to figure out the value of the houses going in or coming in the future. I mean, that would be a huge Maybe. Well, if you don't know it, then when we, like, I've been struggling over the change of uh, farming land to housing, and it's inevitable, and every farmer that lives around me is dying and trying to decide, and the families are trying to decide, is there anybody who's going to farm? And if they don't, the most lucrative thing is to sell it for housing. So, you know, suddenly urban sprawl goes on forever. But how long, like, how much does it cost us to add those lots you know when we and does the revenue balance if you we aren't go thinking an about that i guess and figure right. out i mean just take a one subdivision right. figure out what all our specials were how yeah much the city paid and then how much tax but to predict yeah. that consistently i i'm just i feel ever more responsible to say how are we making sure we just don't turn every, every farm into a subdivision that the future community can't support so you're suggesting that uh an analysis of what the cost benefit out there <clears throat> would be a criteria as to whether or not we approve a new subdivision. I don't think we want to maybe make, I think we need to be aware of like the capacity of our community to make it work. And I know it's a big question when we have one minute left. So I think what city, would that take? I don't know. <laughs> but from my experience in the past, the city is, promoted this from get-go and there must be a must be a big advantage to the city to, to you know put in yes i strategically asked this while we still have steven in the room steven <laughs> well if we go back to the community investments plan we projected a nine to ten billion dollar deficit originally in uh the cost of providing that was just infrastructure we weren't really considering the cost of other services and part of that is because we do have specials to install water sewer and streets but we currently don't have a way to pay for when those things need upgraded and repaired and maintained uh, in the future uh, I mean, we do it for arterials, but all that local stuff, and that, that's one of the big questions uh, Public Works is dealing with in trying to do new uh, ways of repaving and resurfacing roads and stuff like that. But I'm not sure we can cover that deficit, you know, all the way into the future without rethinking how we do some things, and that might include taxes. But you also got to remember that uh, what was the first Dotzer, Dr. Dotzer, he's not a Texas A&M. Gordon Dotzer was his dad. He was a real estate guy here. Did a study years and years ago and proved that subdivisions, new subdivisions, pay for themselves because they create a cash flow for the city of Wichita. Now, some of the officials will say, and some of the other people will say, well, but we're spending that money and it's hurting our bonding capacity and it's doing all this and everything else. But in the long run, the way we do business in Wichita to the special assessment type thing is it beneficial to the city. So it's going to what you just got to saying, how many <clears throat> years does the paving in a subdivision last in relationship to an arterial or to a collector street? 
So, you know, the uh, just look at the cost of replacing ut utilities in the downtown area. It's four times what it, it used to be four times what it is to do a new subdivision. I don't know what it is. New York, a, a pumping truck in every corner, it seems. <laughs> so am I saying we need to repeat the Doxler study to see if it's still ex true? Well, this was done when Marvin Kraut was here, so that's how long ago it was done. And Wes may have a copy of it. I don't know. At one time I had a copy, but I don't have it. Maybe one good first step would be to reach out and find out what resources have been done previously in the community and find out where we're at. Yeah, just in terms of knowing what's been done in the past. Well, what happened with this Dotser deal was the city of Wichita and the home builders were going to pay for this study. Then, then after it was done, I think the home builders ended up paying for all of it themselves, if I remember right. So, and one group I think that's looked into this too has been uh, downtown Wichita. I think uh, Jason Gregory and them have done a look at, um, I think was it just property values per square foot or something like that uh, at one of their meet meetings within, I, I don't know, last six months, maybe four months. So they might be a group that we could reach out to also. And maybe they'd be willing to come in and even just present on what they've found out. Okay, um, let's move on. We have one more item. Uh, Mary would like to discuss uh, changing the start time uh, for advanced plans. Yeah, the reason this is, it's not because we're going over time today necessarily, but it's the time to turn over the room for this afternoon, which does need to be on time. And because they need time to recharge the batteries in these microphones. So, um, I move we start at 10 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, is that early? Is that early enough? I guess is what I'm saying. Yes. It's early so that actually 30 minutes, because we used to meet at eight o'clock in the morning. I think 10 is very good. <laughs> I, think 10, I second 10 is very good. And I would not second a substitute motion. <laughs> I can substitute. No, I'm just asking is, that, is the question is the staff for the reason we're wanting to move it to 10 o'clock is 30 minutes going to be enough to do what they need to do or should, would an hour be better or something that I'm saying. Well, we have a motion and a second to change the uh, date to uh, the time to 10. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oppose the same sign. Motion carries unanimously. When will that start? <laughs> Next meeting is will that be started in uh, January? January, yes. Well, uh, do we have anybody uh, remotely on uh, from the public that would like to comment? Doesn't sound like we do. So there's nobody here. Just, in the just a quick question for Scott. Hey, you're going to uh, go out to the DAB meetings here with the uh, short term rentals. You're going to send out a flyer notification email when that'll be. Yeah, uh, Lonnie, good question. We're going to be working on doing that just today. So getting the website updated and uh, getting a constant contact email sent out. So you bet. All right. Thank you. Are there any other comments remotely? If not, we'll stand adjourned and see everybody at the planning commission. Yeah.